Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tea with. Uh, I am April Sigmund Marks, and today I am here with. I am Jaina Alexander. And we are the founding directors of artistic directors of Thumbprint Studios, located in Chicago and online. Uh, today, we have another fantastic human here to uh, chat with us, Ruxi Kintir. And she's going to be talking with us about working as a multinational artist. One of Scotland's leading visual theater makers, Ruxandra Kintir, is a Moldovia born, US trained, Glasgow based physical theater maker, performer, and teacher. Ruxy holds an MFA in ensemble-based physical theater from Del, a Del Arte International. She devises, performs original work in clown, physical comedy, and movement theater. Recently, she appeared at the 2020 Manipulate Visual Theater Festival in Edinburgh and was commissioned to devise and perform a new outdoor piece for young audiences for the Hans Christian Andersen Festival in Denmark. So not only is she an amazing artist, but she's also one of those super cool humans that like you just want to sit down and chat with, hence why we asked her to tea. So welcome, Roxy. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for being with us today. We're very excited to have you. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is a delight to get to talk to you guys. <laughs> yeah. So we always start with this question. Uh, what is your current obsession? Uh, uh, my current obsession, I think, is desserts. <laughs> and that's not very unusual <laughs> from normal days. But I've found myself baking quite a lot of desserts. Um, so in my fridge now, I have like three different things that I made that I, are, I need to eat, which is good news for me. You know, maybe not good news <laughs> for... Um, you know, my blood vessels, but that's okay. <laughs> do you have, do you have a favorite that you're baking right now? Uh, well, right now I made this cherry cake that my mom makes um, in Moldova that is delicious. Um, so it's basically like Q um, tubes of, of dough that are stuffed with sour cherries. And then you stack them in a pyramid and then you pour sour cream and sugar all over it. It's so good. Um, but you know, also, uh, clogs your arteries but it's so good and it's so worth it <laughs> I think I saw your uh your funny videos that you put up of you doing it while making faces uh at the camera as any good clown would do uh, <laughs> yeah, that sounds like me yeah 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 yeah, yeah absolutely so I would you be willing to share this recipe with oh. our audiences or is this a family secret it's not a family secret, um, and I definitely would be able to, um, to to share the recipe. The problem is that it's it's not exact. It's kind of like you kind of have to eyeball it. And I had my mom on the yeah. phone the entire time, and um, <laughs> so you know I will. Um, I'll try to remember what I did, but um, it's uh, that's how I bake. My collaborator uh, this drives her nuts, but I <laughs> I just kind of eyeball everything and then just. Uh, take it from there. But yes, I will post an approximate recipe. <laughs> okay, approximate. Awesome. Adventures in baking. <laughs> yes. That's yes. very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell us about your journey that's currently led you to where you're at. Okay. Um, so I currently I'm in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, I've been here for all nearly five years to the day almost, I'd say. Uh, but I am I was born and raised in Moldova, which is a small Eastern European country. And I then went to school in the US. So I spent one year of high school in the US and then college for four years and then three years of master's um, also in the US. So I kind of racked up around 10 years of living and, and studying and working in the US. And then I left uh, to come back to Europe and then I kind of bopped around for a while and looking for a base somewhere in Europe. And then I landed in Scotland. And the reason I landed in Scotland was um, I kind of experimented with a few bases when I left the US. Uh, I was in Moldova for a little while. And then I tried, I selected three cities or two cities and a half <laughs> just to test them out and see which ones I, I could, I found myself 
I could see myself living in. So I was in Berlin for a while, which was great. Uh, tried uh, Copenhagen for a while, which is also great. But I think ultimately um, got drawn to Scotland because of certain conversations I had with artists here. And then just kind of decided to, to take a leap of faith and just move to Scotland without knowing anybody here. And just, um, just kind of try to make it work. And five years down the line, and it kind of has, I guess. Wow. So what were some of those conversations that won you over that made you go, yes, this is the place? Yeah, so I um, I was living in uh, Copenhagen and I decided to take a trip to Scotland to kind of investigate. I had uh, been to Scotland before, w- once before. So I um, literally just kind of um, Googled Physical Theatre Scotland and the names that popped up, a couple of companies, a couple of people, I just emailed them and I was like, I'm coming to Scotland to visit and I'm a physical theater artist. I'm looking for a base. Here are my questions. Could we have a chat? And most of them and all of them eventually responded uh, being very open and generous with our time and uh, sitting down for tea with me. And, um, (laughs) and my, my main questions were, you know, what's the physical theater scene? Like is, uh, is there potential to grow, um, Uh, and stuff like this and uh, the conversations I had were really great in the sense that the answers to those questions were yes there's a there's a um, a small but mighty physical theater scene Um, you know more professionals are needed in the field there's a little bit of funding like support from the government when it comes to physical theater and you know the community is quite great so those answers coupled with the generosity of these people whom I met um just kind of made me go, great, I think I want to be here. I think I at least want to try. So I, I, like I said, bit the bullet. And then a month later, I moved there. (laughs) So it's amazing. I mean, the fact that they even emailed you back is, (laughs) (laughs) right? They even responded. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm realizing that that's not quite common in the US, I think, Um, which I didn't really, I mean, I I knew a little bit um, when I was working, I worked in Portland for a little while, but um, yeah, I think that's the, uh, yeah, the the thing in Scotland is that it's, it's quite small. So it's um, where it's a smaller community. And so people, maybe it's a cultural thing as well, but it's uh, people are normally willing to just kind of meet with you for an hour and sit down and say, this is what's happening. And there you go. So yeah, I was quite lucky in that regard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are some of the biggest considerations when it comes to, and not just artistically, but also like logistically, what are some of the biggest considerations that come, that come into moving to another country to be an artist? Yeah. So I had a, I had a few conversations with some of my American friends about this, especially four years ago. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yes. um, And then, you know, and then, two years ago and, you know, just up, up until now, I guess. Um, <laughs> so for me, um, having been born in, in Moldova and raised in Moldova, I kind of, most of my life I had to deal with visas and stuff because anywhere I needed to go, I kind of needed a visa or a permission to leave or to come there. So I, uh, I, c- I could say that that was, uh, first of all, I was used to that. And I think I just kind of took that as a thing that you need to, to do. Um, so, um, so that was a given. I was lucky then later that my family was able to gain Romanian citizenship, uh, Romania being in the mm-hmm. European Union. So for me, what I meant for me was that it opened up a lot of opportunities in terms of traveling freely through the EU and, um, and being able to work there and uh, having freedom of movement, which is why I was able to live in Berlin for two months and then Copenhagen for two months and stuff like this. So that made my life much easier in terms of that. So um, if you can get European Union citizenship, great. Um, (laughs) That makes it that makes it a little easier, I have to say. Uh, But of course, the UK leaving the EU now makes a little bit more complicated, but you know, um, it's still somewhat possible, I think. Um, So yeah, I think if wherever country you're coming from, or, or whatever citizenship you hold, making sure you kind of know the logistical stuff that comes with that in terms of residency and staying there. So I guess that's 
quite self-evident, but um, yeah, you'd be surprised. We don't know because sometimes you live in a place for so long that you then don't, don't think about the fact that, yeah, that, uh, some things are needed when you move to another place uh, in terms of permits to live and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, whatever passport you have, maybe look into that. Um, for logistic, I mean, yeah, it's kind of a case by case basis really. But um, other than that, for me, what was important was um, moving to a place where I could make my own work and collaborate with people. That was really important for me because um, my degree from Del Arte is in ensemble based physical theater. So um, very much ensemble oriented. Um, so that was really important to me. And also um, having a home or a, or a place where I could invest and cultivate a community um, for myself that if it was, if those people weren't doing very similar things to me, at least they were very supportive and it, it acted as a support network, um, as an artistic support ne network in that regard. So those were the things that I was looking out for. Um, so those were the things that I was clocking when talking to all these people and when I lived in those places going, can I see myself live here? Can I build a community here? Is language a thing? That's the other thing, you know. Um, <laughs> um, I speak a little bit of German, for example, but living in Berlin, everybody speaks English, but you still, I mean, if you want to live there, you still want to invest in learning the language, obviously. And um, if, uh, that, that can take a lot of time. And for me, I, I was so eager <laughs> to just start working that um, I just, I, I, I was like, no, I just need place now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so i i was i love languages and i speak a little bit of german but i think for me kind of weighing it down i was like i think i need to be in an english speaking environment because that's basically my second it's it is my second language so yeah um but so yeah i think just kind of figuring what's figuring out what's important to somebody when you move to a country so that if you're looking for if it's related to work and your artistic practice then you, 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 you know how to make those decisions according to what your point of view and what your focus is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so speaking of, of making work and, and point of view, what are you currently working on? Uh, well, <laughs> work- I know, the, tough I'm, question right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you guys know this as well, but it's been a bit, you know, um, uh, it's been a, an interesting adjustment. It's an interesting dance. Um, so my, um, my one of my collaborators, we had a couple of projects on the go, but obviously all of that stopped when the lockdown, first lockdowns uh, happened. But luckily, because she and I um, lived together for a while, we were able to kind of continue working and treated the first lockdown as a bit of a residency, which was great because you know, it distracted from all the crazy madness that was happening outside our windows. And um, so, yeah, so we managed to do some video things and some, um, uh, and yeah, things that we filmed that we then posted later. Um, but so currently um, when the lockdown started, we had put in an, uh, a funding application for a show for young audiences called Two in a Barrel. That was uh, about two girls stuck in a barrel on top of a rubbish heap in the ocean. And that was meant to be kind of like a, like a Samuel Beckett meets Pixar show <laughs> um, for, for ages five plus. And, oh. uh, but obviously when all that happened, uh, lots of funding things changed. So we had to kind of reassess and blah, 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 all that stuff. The good news is that we, met, we managed to reapply with a um, reimagined way of working. And that's what we're working on right now. We got some of that funding and we're working on on the show. Um, my collaborator and I, Sarah Rose Graber, are in an extended household, so we're able to still work together. Yeah. And it's been it's been a delight because we get to to fulfill that vision finally, and um, keeping our fingers crossed that we can tour it as planned in the spring. I don't know if that's going to happen, but you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that's one thing. That's one collaborator, and then. I'm working with four other um, mad people that are my pals on a clown, um, on a clown version of Dracula. <laughs> uh, that sounds amazing. 
Yes, everything about that. I love it. <laughs> it's called Draculala. And uh, <laughs> of and, course it is. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. Um, and it's quite, it's quite anarchic and quite mad. And uh, we did a 35 minute version of it at the festival at Manipulate Festival, um, I guess this year. So feels like a million years ago. But so for the, uh, for the next edition of the festival, we, we had been planning of, um, to, to make a full uh, version of the show, but obviously uh, all of that went out the window. But right now we're focusing on basically making a music video and a song um, for, the, for the festival. So it's, we're making up a song and we're gonna shoot a music video and uh, it's gonna be the Dracula of the music video for and by fools. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I played Dracula, so that's very stupid. It's very, very stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. I, I feel like, you know, stupid or silly. Like that's the best kind of work. And and right now I feel like so needed. Oh man. I be yes. Yes. So there for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So how are you uh, working to get funding for all of these different projects? Are they all grants? Are you doing crowdfunding? Do you have um, patrons? Like what is, what is your method of going about getting the, the funding to even do these things? Yeah, so um, that was one of the reasons why I decided to move here, I think, because some of those people that I was talking to did say that there is some funding support for the arts and for physical mm. theater, stuff like that. So I will say that, um, Coming from um, from Moldova, uh, um, which is the poorest country in Europe and <laughs> has the farthest thing from arts funding possible, mm -hmm. and then having lived in the U.S. for ten years, where uh, public funding is is next to nil, um, coming here it was kind of like, oh, you just kind of apply for for money and then you sometimes get it. <laughs> It was a bit like, um, yeah, it was, it, it felt, it feels luxurious sometimes. And um, Scotland funding and UK funding is, is good, but it's also not um, as big as say some other European countries like the Scandinavian countries or France or Germany or stuff like that. So I'd say that Scotland and UK poses itself in terms of arts funding or public funding kind of right smack in the middle between the US and, um, and the mainland Europe. Um, pretty much where ge geographically it stands to. So, <laughs> um, so it is, it is good and I'm very grateful for a lot of it. Um, and uh, it's, it's competitive, don't get me wrong. It's not like you just kind of write an application and then you, you get it immediately. It's quite competitive and it's, um, it, it's not without its faults, um, but it definitely makes a difference when you're, like for this piece that we're working on right now for two in a barrel <clears throat> uh, to be able to just get some public funding and fulfill that vision feels really lovely and important. Um, especially since it's a piece that is not only uh, hopefully fun and um, just raucous, but also has, um, has some environmental kind of connotations about how we, uh, about our relationship to waste. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's good. It's actually, I think, feel like a lot of arts councils, especially now are kind of reevaluating how to do this in a pandemic. And in Scotland, we've been lucky enough where Creative Scotland, which is the name of our arts funding body, um, did, I think a lot to try to help, um, to try to help artists. A good example of that being a hardship fund that they put out where you, if you felt you needed the money, this was a fund that was non-competitive and you just applied mm. for a maximum mm. sum and you just got it. So, and I know that it's, uh, again, it's not without its faults and it made some other mistakes in terms of other things, absolutely. But I have to say like something like that was tremendously helpful in the beginning of the pandemic when, you know, all that stuff hit and nobody <laughs> knew what the hell was happening. And you kind of go, I don't know. So the Arts Council coming there with a, a, lending, a helping hand was really great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it sounds like it 
it's still pretty competitive to get funding grant wise where you're at, which I mean, as you said here in the US, it's incredibly competitive to try to get any type of funding. Do you have any tips for people who are applying to grants to help them stand out so that they can make themselves more competitive? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm learning that myself still. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what I've learned is that <clears throat> it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a muscle that you get better at the more you do it, obviously. And I'm sure you guys know about this too, but you know, the first application I wrote years ago was kind of like, uh, you know, it's a bit embarrassing to look at it in retrospect, but it's because we don't know as artists, we're, we're trained to do our art, not to write grants, which is, you know, infuriating to certain, <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, yes. uh, yes. I didn't spend three years, you know, with a nose on my nose, with a clown nose on my nose to then kind of sit in front of a computer and go, okay, what's the budget for this? You know what I mean? Like, these are all we kind of learn as we go. So it obviously takes a little bit of time. It's a muscle that we develop and we cultivate. And then eventually you get to the point where you're able to, to come up with an application that's that reflects great your uh, your expectations and your intentions as an artist so I think the first thing that I would say is if it is one of the first applications that you're writing for a funding body <clears throat> get um, to get somebody who's not in the arts to read it um, because <laughs> I think as artists we try so hard to, to kind of make it feel necessary that we kind of say uh, mind bot, you know, blah, 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 all the stuff. And it, it is, uh, but it's also like, yeah, but what's the, the meat and potatoes of this? If, if you can say it in a sentence, great. So people who are not in the arts are, um, can read it and kind of go like, oh, I was a little bit confused when you said, you know, mind bending, you know, what does that mean for an arts funding body? Um, and what, uh, yeah, specific, like the specifics of the proposal, um, people who are not in the arts, I think might be able to offer some cool insight. Um, and what else, what else? Um, I think if there's, um, <clears throat> if there's um, webinars or like stuff like that, that say, before you apply, you can go to this, definitely take it up because then you can, you can see a little bit of what they're looking for. And I, I don't, I'm not saying this uh, to be understood that you have to adapt your artistic vision to fit that. Um, I'm not saying that because that's always visible when you read an application, I think. It's just to kind of see, just to acquaint yourself with what the organization is about, um, what, uh, what's important to them. And if they align with what you wanna do, great and if if it doesn't then um maybe it's good to interrogate that a little bit more to see if it's the right thing because again i think people who read these applications always know if you're trying to fit uh what is that expression round thing in a square so, uh, yeah a square peg in a round hole yeah that's it that's it yeah, yeah. so people will know that <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah so that that's kind of right off the top of my head but i think the yeah, the, the more time you spend with it and the more people you have to look at it, the, the better. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do your homework on the organization. That's such a great reminder of like, get to know who they are and what their values are, what they're looking for to see if you're a match. And, and if you are to like highlight those matches of like, oh, see, we sync up in this way. We should work together. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for example, in Creative Scotland, Right now, like um, if they come up with a, with a report, I think every year or every couple of years or something, and then you can see some of the stuff that they're focusing on, you know, in terms of like, we're really keen on supporting this, this, and this. Uh, everything, we're really keen on supporting everything, but also, but specifically these things. So then for for us, when we applied to Two in a Barrel, it was a happy, uh, a happy coincidence because we were already thinking about this piece as a, having environmental kind of connotations and things to think about. So the fact that that was one of the things that Creative Scotland was looking at getting more of was, was great for us. So we were able to kind of, like you say, April mentioned that even bring that to the foreground even more so that it's bam, clear, 
for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which probably makes their job easier of like, oh, yep, we are definitely in line with this, this group. Let's move them to the yes pile. Oh, Anytime totally. you can make someone's job easier, your chances of getting chosen, I think, go up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you can get your hands on, if you have pals who have had a successful application, that's another thing. It's like, uh, you know, if, if they're willing to share that with you just to have a look, like, that's also really good. Because again, like speaking personally, I had no clue. I had no idea, you know, that for when they ask, what do you want to do? You, you don't have to write a whole novel about it or like a, uh, an academic paper the way we would write in, in college, you know? It's, a, it's just a different kind of writing. It's not the same type of writing that you write when you write a press release. It's not that. It's not when you do your free writing that's for your artistic purposes. It's not when you do an, an academic paper. It's a completely different style. So you kind of have to hone it a little bit. And all the different ways of writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that we all basically are supposed to know, right? Just yeah. kind of, oh, yeah, you know that. It's like, well. No, <laughs> but I will now that I have to. God. Yes. Right. <laughs> like I got a degree in rolling on the floor. I don't know how to, to write that way. Yeah. Wait, there's a difference? What? <laughs> I don't know how to write that way, but I can flock. So what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But yeah, how, how are you guys finding it in Chicago? Because Chicago is a pretty cool city, like with lots of cool like organizations happening and maybe some public funding. How are you guys finding it there in terms of this type of stuff? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a little different uh, because it's a lot more competitive. Um, so there's a lot more, and things seem to be a lot, because there's not a, unlike in Scotland where there's like a governing body, right? Most of these institutions are private uh, that are giving out grants. So there's a lot more, um, uh, their requirements are a lot more narrow. So it's, uh, you know, those three things that uh, Creative Scotland were like, we're outlining this year, those would be like requirements here right. where mm -hmm. like, those have to be the things that you are like doing in order to even apply gotcha. for something. So it's a, it's a lot of like weeding through all of the things that you don't qualify for. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems as well that there's a lot of small uh, grants. So you, you have to kind of piecemeal your, your funding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's yeah, a, yes, it's it, that's really interesting. And and me and my collaborator Sarah Rose often talk about this because obviously her experience was more oh, well. Not, she's lived here for five years now, so yeah, she's got experience with public funding here. But having lived and worked and studied in in Chicago for so long, she's got that experience a little bit as well. And she and I have conversations about this quite often because. I should say that while yeah, we have Creative Scotland here in Scotland, and you know. Arts Council England and England and all the rest of it. Um, that's kind of, that's the public sector of funding that's developed, that's like this. But when you look at private stuff, it's, it's not, uh, there are some for sure, but it's, uh, you know, it's definitely not as developed as the, as the ones in the U S. So um, I mentioned this because as arts funding gets less and less and less money from the government every year, which is what's happening, unfortunately, especially with the pandemic now as well. So, you know, it'll become less money from, we'll get less money from the government for Creative Scotland and Creative Scotland will have less money to give to artists. Um, the people are starting to think about different ways of how to, how to piecemeal your project if you need to have a bigger project. So then, but the problem is that it's, the private sector is not as developed as it, the one in the U.S. is. So it's it's kind of trying to figure out that balance a little bit and understanding that a little bit of private stuff is actually quite good sometimes because it doesn't just make you depend on one funding body um, that already is just over, um, just saturated with applications at any given point. Mm -hmm. um, 
because we've had so many, like even personally, we've had so many great applications that went in that had like a top um, scoring of points, but it's just that there's just no, not enough money. So you get rejected because of that. Um, but then the alter there's not really as many alternatives privately. So, you know, what's that balance? Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and in that way, it, the US is the opposite. So there's, yeah. there's some like federal funding, but it's mostly given to like bigger projects. Uh, and there's significantly more private funding because there's not nearly as much federal funding. So in that way, we're like the complete opposite. So, totally. and I think the most healthy is to have like a good combination of both, right? Um, yeah. So that you have a bit of options and let's say you do do a, a show about trash then you don't only for in an ideal world, let's say you don't only go to create to your public funding uh, body. You also go to a waste management site that has money that can give you a little bit for that. And you have that, you know, stuff like this, that yeah. might be an interesting combination. <laughs> yeah. Ways to get creative mm -hmm. in the funding. And also, yeah. let me just say that all of this stuff, this is producer chat, you know, like we shouldn't, we as artists, it's just kind of, <laughs> I mean, we kind of step into these roles because we have to, right? But it's also mm -hmm. like, oh, for goodness sake, like I'm wearing like a million hats and the hats are stacked up to the ceiling because we're doing all these things. Yep. Like, yeah. April and I talk about them in terms of sandboxes a lot. Mm -hmm. Like what sandboxes do you play in? But like we have so many, all of the people that we you know, work with are such multi hyphenates that at some point it just becomes ridiculous to like, yeah, we don't have sandboxes anymore. We have the beach. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my. Yeah. Well, we are running out of time, but before we go, what would you like to leave everyone with today? Hmm. I think I've, I personally have been thinking a lot about time recently. And um, I think when, when, when we, I was talking to you guys about potentially doing this and, you know, all the questions that we would maybe touch on, it kind of made me think of the fact that I've been in Scotland for nearly five years and nothing happens overnight. You know, I think coming, uh, coming right out of drama school and all that stuff, you know, where the rhythm is crazy, you know, you do 5 million different things in one day. <laughs> we did that you know it's just like oh we just made three pieces till four o'clock um so um so I, but it's a different pace in the real world and obviously it's a much more different pace even now so I think for me kind of thinking about my relationship to time and how things take time and patience is a great virtue that's earned um and also just because we don't really have another choice just to kind of lean into that, I think, and, and interrogate and examine our, our, our relationship to time in this hibernation period, because that's definitely what it feels like here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially with the time change. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you, we super appreciate having you on um and thank you for everyone who's joining us live right now uh so on monday december 7th we have our december reads and listens our last one for the year uh we will be discussing abraham's daughters by emma goldman sherman uh should be a very interesting discussion um Additionally, next week's Tea With will be with the hosts of the podcast, The Educated Actor, who are Natalie Cruz, Matt Belness, and Carolina Zique. They will be releasing their first episode of their second season. And guess who are their guests? Oh, it's April and I. Oh, imagine that. So the day the podcast is coming out, which is the 27th, we will be having them on our live stream for tea. So everybody please join in because we have a very special announcement uh, that you all should tune in for. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. Um, and we will hope to see you all 
next week. So have a fantastic rest of your day. Uh, and we will see you next week. Thank you, ladies. Thank, Thank you so you, much, Roxy. Roxy. Until next time. <laughs>